for transportation and infrastructure projects in the South Bay communities and across the country. Lately, as you know, there's been a lot of discussion about infrastructure at the national level. Last week, on February 12th, the President released the administration's fiscal year 2019 budget proposal along with a plan that is purportedly intended to leverage $1.5 trillion in infrastructure spending over 10 years. However, the President's plan provides only $200 billion in federal infrastructure funding over 10 years, and it's going to rely on states and Mr. Mayor, local governments, and private investors for the rest of the funding. And so I'm concerned about that. Of the $200 billion, the plan makes $100 billion available as an incentive for states and local governments, which would have to provide an 80% match. For comparison purposes, the 1956 law signed by Republican President Eisenhower that built the interstate highway system provided 90% of highway construction costs, while the states were required to pay only a 10% match. Most states and local governments will not be able to finance 80% of the cost of a major infrastructure project, so they will not benefit from this plan. But of course, we're going to fight about that. <laughs> we're going to see what we can do about that. Of the remaining funds made available in the President's plan, $50 billion would go to rural communities and would not be accessible to our region. Another $20 billion would be made available for federal loans to attract private investment, which could result in private companies building toll roads. The remaining funds would go to other activities. At the same time, the President's budget reduces transportation and infrastructure funding in his budget by $168 billion over 10 years. Highway, transit, and highway safety funding is cut by $122 billion over 10 years. In addition, the budget proposes <coughs> to eliminate the U.S. Department of Transportation's popular Tiger Grants program that I just talked about, which funds investments in transporta transportation infrastructure by states and local transit agencies like Metro, Torrance Transit, and Gardena's G-Trans. Overall, the budget proposal released last week would cut fiscal year 2019 transportation funding by 14% below the fiscal year 2017 level. Now, if you hear some contradictions here about the so-called infrastructure plan that's being presented by the President and these cuts that you hear in the Department of Transportation, you're hearing correctly. There are contradictions, and of course, we're going to fight about that too. <laughs> I think there will be a robust conversation in Washington over the upcoming weeks and months about transportation and infrastructure funding and the appropriate amount of federal investments. I've long advocated for additional federal transportation and infrastructure investments. At the center of the discussion will be an examination of how the federal government can invest in infrastructure without shifting the burden to states and local communities to come up with an unrealistic and unreasonable share of the funding. A word about what is going on and you should be concerned about as it relates to our beach and coastal communities, offshore oil drilling. The President's decision to open up the entire Pacific coastline to offshore oil drilling is also causing a robust debate in Washington. I believe this decision would have a devastating impact upon California, especially for coastal cities in the South Bay, like Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach, and Hermosa Beach. Offshore oil drilling is opposed by overwhelming bipartisan majorities throughout California. California families and small businesses depend on the help of our oceans for food, commerce, and a thriving tourism industry. An offshore oil disaster like the Deepwater Horizon oil spill would be severely damaging for our state. I strongly oppose the President's decision, and I'm working with my colleagues to protect our coastline from offshore drilling. We're going to fight about that, too.
So I was asked to talk about infrastructure and transportation and water, but also immigration. As you know, aside from the debate on federal spending, infrastructure investments, and offshore oil drilling, one of the most contentious and robust public policy debates in Washington, D.C., is on the topic of immigration. Again, this is an area of uncertainty in which affected immigrants, businesses, state and local governments, and the various stakeholders on all sides of the debate are desperate for long-term clarity in law. Recently, much of the discussion has centered on the continuation of the Deferred Action for Children Arrivals. You have been hearing a lot about the DACA program, which the administration announced would be phased out by March 5th, 2018. Nationally, there are about 800,000 DACA participants. These participants are people who came to America as children, innocent of any wrongdoing. They're paying taxes, passed a background check, and are valued and active members of our society and contributors to our economy. About a quarter of those, uh, these individuals live in California, and roughly 13% live in this region. Outside of just DACA and referring to immigrants in general, there are roughly 2.5 million green card and visa holders living in the state. The American Immigration Council estimates that nearly 34% of California's entire labor force is foreign born, as are 40% of business owners in the Los Angeles, Long Beach, Anaheim metropolitan area. Immigrants are our neighbors, business owners, employees, and taxpayers. It is to everyone's benefit, immigrant and natural born citizen alike, to reform our immigration system to at the very best establish some certainty in law. Reforming our nation's immigration law is not a new endeavor. Over the last several years and over the last few presidential administrations, there have been attempts at bipartisan agreements on immigration reform. For example, in 2004, during President George W. Bush's administration, Senator John McCain and late Senator Edward M. Kennedy, among others, uh, got together and among other provisions, that bill that they put forward offered a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants, increase border security, and address hiring practices regarding undocumented immigrants. The Senate bill passed, but did, it passed the Senate, but did not pass the House, despite being supported by President Bush. We then crossed into the Obama administration, where there was significant discussion, but again, no successful legislation. Perhaps the most notable attempt at immigration legislation during that time frame was in 2013, when the Gang of Eight, a bipartisan group of senators, introduced a bill that would have made it possible for millions of undocumented immigrants to gain legal status while also putting them on a 13-year path to citizenship. However, at the same time, that bill also included increased border security and repealed the diversity visa lottery program, which gives a limited number of visas to immigrants from underrepresented countries. That bill died in the 113th Congress. Those were some conservative attempts at reaching bipartisan compromise. Many people across the country on both sides of the aisle are hopeful that the conversation on immigration, which reached a fever pitch in the last month, would spark legislative action that would resolve the years of lingering uncertainty with respect to our immigration system. However, we appear to have returned to the persistent stalemate that has existed on many of these issues. Last week, the Senate engaged in a debate on the issue of immigration, although the prospects had seemed promising that a bipartisan compromise bill could pass the Senate, the Senate failed to advance any of the four immigration proposals before it last Thursday. Those proposals included a deal that was spearheaded by Senator Susan Collins, which was considered by many to be the legislation with the best chance of passing. That bill offered a path to citizenship to DACA, 
eligible immigrants, provided as much as $25 billion for border security, and maintained the diversity visa lottery program. While that particular bill, like the other proposals on the table, failed to achieve the 60 votes necessary to advance, that bill had the support of a bipartisan group of at least 54 senators. Unfortunately, it seems as though we may not be close to a resolution on this issue that will pass both the House and the Senate and become acted, enacted into law. Nevertheless, I, like many of my colleagues, strongly believe that there is a need for urgent action, and I will continue to be engaged in this issue. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to get this right. We've got to understand what we can do to understand who makes up uh, our populations in the United States, what should they have to do to become legal citizens, what we're going to do about DACA, these young people who are here through no fault of their own. It looks as if the President of the United States is about to get $25 billion to build a wall in exchange for giving some, some help to the DACA uh, young people in this country. It looks to me that that's the way that it's going. A little bit more about tax, and then I'm going to be finished. I remember last year, I went over my time. I was trying not to do that this time, but of course I got a lot to talk about. So, while immigration and infrastructure are two of the unresolved policy debates in Washington, D.C., a great deal of the uncertainty of this past year has related to the debate over the new tax law. California faces unique challenges under this new law, which many economists are suggesting that it will negatively affect our growth and harm the state's competitiveness. The new law, which was enacted late last year, reduces or eliminates key deductions that are relied on by Californians. It is expected to raise the cost of living for many middle class households. Some of the most important changes in the tax law are alterations to the state and local tax deduction, or SALT, as we refer, refer to it, and the mortgage interest rate deduction. These two changes greatly affect California. Before the new tax law, taxpayers could deduct everything they pay in state and local income property and sales tax. The new law caps SALT to $10,000 for income property and sales tax combined. Approximately 3 million Californians already pay more than $10,000 a year in state taxes. In California, 34% of people claim the deduction, including 29% of tax filers right here in my congressional district. The average value of the SALT deduction for a California household that claim, claims it is over $18,000. Before the new tax law, if you itemize your deductions, you could write off qualifying mortgage interest payments for real estate purchases for up to $1 million. This $1 million cap used to apply not only to a primary residence, but also a second home. The new law reduced the mortgage interest rate deduction by 25% which has a particularly significant impact on California and specifically homeowners in this region and other high-cost cities. From January to October of 2017, approximately 10% of all new home loans in California were over the new $750,000 cap. Notably, the new cap is less than the medium home value in Torrance, which is $812, $812,400. In addition to the changes in deductions, the new tax law significantly increases the national deficit. The amount of projected debt added to the deficit is at least $1.5 trillion over the next decade, with some economists estimating that it could be significantly higher than that, even over $2 trillion. Some have argued that those estimates don't account for economic growth created by the law, but the Bipartisan Joint Congressional Committee on Taxation has estimated that the law still adds at least $1 trillion to the deficit, even when accounting for economic growth. Adding too much to the deficit 
especially this fast, can have severe negative consequences on our economy in the long term. This type of deficit spending is not sustainable. As a ranking member of the Financial Services Committee, I will be monitoring the deficit.